Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you out on this beautiful Sunday morning. Beautiful weather, and although some didn't get rain, some did, and thank the Lord for that. And if anyone wants a cat, you see them outside. <laughs> I'll take care of that. I will freely bestow upon you the blessing of a tomcat, whoever wants it. Uh, it's too late. Our family just announced uh, beyond your knowings that they've been praying. I know they were praying for, for a long time. I know. And the mysteries of the Lord uh -huh. brought a beautiful tabby milk cat Great. good hunter. I hear that. Into your home. Uh -huh. so, so please welcome the cat. <laughs> <laughs> They've been praying for a cat and I've been praying the other way, so I don't know <laughs> which, which, which prayers are ways which prayers were working. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say two or more are gathered. <laughs> anyway, um, we had our men's group last night and had a really good time. And I guess since that Tomcat decided it was a men's meeting, he decided to join us. Um, and then Joe decided to feed the cat, and anyway, it was down from there. <laughs> But thank you so much for coming out, and it's so good to see all of you. And it's so nice that Felicity finally got into church. She'd been absent for a while. She was here, you know, off and on for like nine months, and then disappeared for a while. But now she's back, so I'm glad to see that. And if you question who she looks like, look at Facebook. Clear that up really quick. <laughs> All right, let's start the service with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, that we can be in your presence today and worship together with our, our family and friends. And Lord, would you come and be with us in a special way this morning? Help us to listen to your voice. In your name, amen. Let's stand up and sing. Hey, turn to page 20. Page 20, great and mighty. We're gonna sing that through twice. Yeah. 
You know, in this day we live, it's, trust is a hard thing to find. To know you can trust Jesus, that's, that's pretty awesome. Ushers, if you're ready, we'll take up the offering. Greg, can you wipe, can you wipe that smell off your face, please? <laughs> I have the Father give the count of privilege to come to you. We thank you for all the blessings. We thank you for the rain. We bless your people and give you your work. Lord, we just thank you most of all for your spirit to be in the So we keep your praise in Jesus' name. <laughs> Did I say, or is it Roseanne? Roseanne and Leah. Roseanne. Who's next? I have three. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, this week I had a mother with message coming to me. Um, trying to change ways, habits. <laughs> it's as you know, it's very hard. But uh, Colossians 3 helped me out a lot this week. And in my studies this week, um, I was taught to start looking up. Don't look at this the temptation, but look up that heaven is real and so is hell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been trying to practice that a lot. It, it just stuck with me and it helped me out a lot. That's all I'm saying. Sure. Thank God. Did you ever hear the statement, if you look down, you only see defeat? Yeah. It's a good thing to keep in mind. It's kind of a play on words, but. Helen? I had a praise. Um, I thank God for the ring you got. Yep. Greg and I graduated on Friday, and we need to remember all the people who graduated because you know what happens to the world, and there are a lot of things that they're going to be involved in, and, and they're going to need our prayers and stuff. So, yeah. um, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, it's kind of it's great to see a graduate, but it's terrible to see her grow up that fast. <laughs> um, yeah. And I saw a picture, my son put a picture of um, me and his son and all put a picture, and I didn't know Nelson and Cindy were there until I saw the picture. And I said, Somebody was in the picture. <laughs> and anyway, um, but I was, yeah. Way to mess up the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and I had a prayer request. Uh, Karen got her report back with a lump that they found, and she has stage four cancer. Oh, wow. So she goes Friday to. 
put forward and um, start cleaning it herself. Okay. Um, but she says she's going to be thinking positive that God's going to be with her and he's going to heal her. So, okay. just, you know. Yeah, I remember my graduation day and there was just that's a lot of uncertainty. So, pray the Lord be with those. As Samantha did, and I know Echo did. Heidi did. Heidi did it, right? Next year. See you. And Gwen did it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else? Monica? Oh, uh, my grandson also graduated, and he graduated from where I graduated. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thank you for the safe, safety on the highway going down to Burke to Lancaster County. And um, like Helen said, pray for his senior kids. But he's going to be going to be some attack school and he's going to be driving for probably about 45 minutes each way for like 19 months. So, yeah, they have a lot and they have a lot to work through with this society. And everything. Yeah, today is, is challenging for it sure. It is very challenging for these young people. He's had a couple of bumps in his senior year, but he's working through it. Okay. Keep praying for him. I I heard this new, well, it's new to me, song on, on uh, Facebook the other day. Somebody had posted about uh, how do we express our thanks to God? There just isn't isn't a way that's sufficient. To God be the glory. No. Okay. Um. Anyway, for I don't know a few years, I cried a lot, <laughs> and it's been a few years since then. And uh, Ray and I try to purposefully live a very simple life, as simple as we can. And it's the simple things that, that are just so joyful and yeah. profound. And I'm so thankful for everything that he's given to us. And um, Mackenzie got to got to help on a dairy farm a couple of times, once in the af Friday afternoon and Saturday morning at 3 o'clock. Wow. She is going to be working with you. <laughs> Not unless she lives with you. <laughs> but it's just so neat to uh, see young children really enjoying those simple things also. And just um, nature and the, just a wonderful, incredible, amazing world the Lord's blessed us with. We get caught up so quickly in our problems and, it's, and we lose sight of the blessings really fast. And I've been reminding myself here recently, you know, yeah, I have pain from time to time and I have my issues, whatever, but then I look around and realize how blessed I am because of some of what other people are dealing with. And, um, yeah, and just watching it rain last night, that was just, that smell when it hasn't rained for a long time and you get a little bit of rain, that's probably one of my favorite smells in the world. It's just like, wow, that smells so good. Thank God for our blessings. Adeline? Um, I just want to praise God for all the good news this past week. Um, Mom went to the doctors and got a very good report. She still has a few stitches in, but other than that, she's doing very well. And I praise God for being with her. I also praise God because yesterday we found out um, Uncle Eugene is doing very well. Good. Um, we were concerned for him for a while because he was having hallucinations and other issues, but it was a medication and it took him off and he's doing very well good. and ready to come home Monday. And I just praise God for the good news. Um, then I do have a prayer request. My cousin Ethan, they found something on his lymph nodes and he has to go for testing things. And he has Isabella and Gavin, and Gavin's five months, Isabella will be three. So um, just pray for him that it's really nothing. Okay. Pray for Ethan. Susie? Yeah, keep praying for our friend Donald. Uh, the Lord 
salaries are more um, called the chief and out the medical center that she had set by charge which is the medic at like probably the ambulance. Um, she's had now with her daughters with her and, and she just can't seem to get back her health or stress except she had COVID really bad months ago. Really bad. And uh, she's eighty eight. She'll be eighty nine June thirtieth. But pray for her. I pray for our neighbor Jean Rosenberry. She still has some uh, just get a pacemaker and her heart valve. So she's weak. And uh, I sat with her yesterday a little bit, but she uh, she should have a positive outlook. And just pray for her. Canada, a uh, praise for the men's group last night and how many showed up. I mean, just the fellowship. And like Jacob said, he went afterwards, he was talking, he was excited about the rain and talking about the spouse. So he's not making that up. That was <laughs> verify that. <laughs> Now, so we want to praise the Lord for our, our granddaughter's graduation. And then Frank, her cousin, less than two weeks, she's headed to Bolivia for a couple week missionary trip. So she and did decide to do that then. Yeah. And so there's a group of them going to just pray for them that they make that trip. I think I was the second person to hear about that. <laughs> pray for Kristen as she's going to Bolivia. Uh, yeah, I see it up in the air. Go ahead. Uh, we went to graduation too for his granddaughter, and there was a, we didn't get out of there till after nine o'clock, going on ten, trying to get out of the place. <laughs> and so we didn't get home till ten o'clock to, to go to bed because that was a long time. Because we had to be there at five o'clock, and we sat in those hard benches and stuff like that, but we refused it because I. Could, I took a seat with me, and I was the only one that was smart enough to take a seat with me. And also, my test came back pretty good for my MRI. They couldn't find nothing, but except for, for people get older, that's a little bit of damage back there. Okay. So right now, I'm glad my MRI came back okay. Good. Larry, you're going to preach. Yeah. Okay. No, we just like to... Thank the congregation and everybody for praying for the future. We got a ways to hear it. We were ever saying yesterday, you can see very far away now. He just got disappointed and I said Wednesday night what we what came in and I'll just announce it. With the matching from the church treasury, we're gonna give him six thousand. And I was I shouldn't say I'm surprised because I wasn't, but you guys are so generous, that's so awesome to watch. All right. Ready to go to prayer? Join with me then, please. Thank you, Lord, for this time of sharing we've had. And as we were, as uh, Pam said, about the blessings in life, Lord, you have been so gracious and, and, and good to us, and we praise you for what you do for us. And we just stopped at the plan of salvation. That would be plenty of praise enough, but you do so much beyond that, and we praise you. Thank you for our church, our family. Thank you for generosity that's demonstrated here I pray to continue to bless our church and help it to be a lighthouse to those that need to hear about you there's a lot of people struggling Lord and we have a list of prayer requests and we know that you care about each one more than we do we think of those that are home now because of various health issues and like Martha Mary Jane Jack like Tim 
Lord, would just be with them in a special way. Thank you that Corleen's getting around better these days and continue to help her. Thank you for the progress Steve has made and pray that you will give him full recovery and give him strength. Continue to be with Keegan and the challenges that this poor girl is facing and the family that working with her. Be with um, Karen, Helen's niece, and the diagnosis she received and pray to keep her strong and be with her and strengthen her. Be with our, all of our graduates that uh, are starting a new chapter in life. Most, most than anything, Lord, would you help them to keep their eyes on you because that is the most important thing. And I pray you'll give them wisdom and grace and strength as they move forward in life. Continue to be with the Gettles. Continue to help Dave heal and strengthen their family. Be with Bonnie's two friends that are struggling physically, Leah and Roseanne. Just uh, be with them in a special way. Be with Adeline's cousin, Ethan. That this won't be an issue. There will be no problems. As there's young children to take care of. Susie's friends, Lord, she requests a prayer for you. Give them strength and, and healing. Be with Kristen as she's going to be <coughs> traveling on a missions trip. Would you help her to be a blessing? Would you help her to be blessed from it? We thank you, Lord, for the incredible love you have for us. And I pray you help us to reciprocate that and show it to others. Bless us now as we enter your word. And would you just be with us in your name? Amen. I have a few announcements to share with you, and then Jessica has a VBS announcement to share before the last song. Uh, Tomorrow evening is our Sunday School Board meeting at 6.30. Next Sunday, I believe I have this right, Ben, is the breakfast, right? Um, our carport breakfast. Do not feed the cat. It's still around. <laughs> uh, that's at 9.15 here in the carport. Just remember our VBS coming up, and Jess is going to announce that, more about that, but 19 through 23rd. And then... Um, Next Sunday night, we're going to have focus group. We haven't had that for quite a while, so we're working on that next Sunday night. All right. All right, so for VBS announcement, I just want to be the reminder to keep this date in mind. Um, June 19th through the 23rd, 645 to 845. You might be thinking, okay, that's only two weeks away. I still need help. I still need two helpers for classes. Every class should have about two helpers because we have um, condensed our classes from six to five. So there's going to be more kids in the classes um, than other years. So it's really important to have those two helpers in there. Um, and two classes are lacking that. Um, I need more help in craft if you're willing to come for that. I need somebody to do um, just one night, Friday night, for the sound. Um, so if you can't do all, all week, you just need to one night. So if you um, could possibly think about how you can help and how you can be a blessing to these kids, um, please see me after church because I really would like those spots filled. It takes a village. It takes all of us doing our part. So um, please seek me out. Also, um, the first night, um, if you are helping or if you're not helping and you want to join us, however you want to do that, but um, arrive at 6.30, um, maybe even a little bit before if you're a teacher and you want some time um, to get things organized. But at 6.30 on Monday, we are going to do a prayer. Um, I think that was really uh, powerful last, uh, last year. Um, so we want to pray for each teacher, each helper, each person that is involved in VBS. So come out at 6.30 for the first night um, so that we can do a prayer together. Okay, that's all I have for VBS. Now the next song, the last song that we're gonna sing today is Faith is the Victory, it's page 521. And the reason I'm singing this song is because it's a VBS song this year. So I'm already getting your toes wet a little bit. Um, and we are gonna be singing this song for VBS. And I think it's important that um, the kids here some of our old time hymns, not so much old time, but old time to me maybe, um, hymns that um, are sung. And so um, I hope you really listen to the words that um, what faith can do for us. Oh, please stand. Thank you. 
me to Galatians chapter 6. A 1936 Bugatti Type 57SC Atlantic, widely regarded as one of the most beautiful and famous automobiles ever produced, was the subject of the most costly car restoration in history. Only two of the four Atlantics that were ever made are still in existence. Dr. Peter Williamson, a neurologist and car collector from California, was the owner of the vehicle in question. The car was in poor shape when Dr. Williamson bought it in the 1970s because it had been in a catastrophic accident and sustained significant body and chassis damage. The automobile was covered in dust and trash after spending years parked in a barn. Years were invested by Dr. Williamson in finding the original components required for the restoration, which included a thorough reconstruction of the body and chassis. Over 10 years were spent in the restoration by some of the most skilled and educated experts in the automotive industry. Each component of the car was meticulously disassembled and either repaired or replaced as necessary. The car's body was recreated using the same methods and supplies that the Bugatti originally employed in the 1930s, including hand-formed aluminum panels. This restoration was thought to have commanded around $40 million earning it the most costly car restoration ever. The vehicles were pre presented in a 2010 car show, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce it, where it took the most suitable uh, show trophy, also harding its place as one of, the most of one of the numerous expensive sought after vehicles in the world. The Bugatti automobile is one of the most valuable automobiles in the world today, the Atlantic. It is considered a masterwork of automotive design and engineering and this repaired vehicle is appreciated at an estimated $100 million. The car's restoration is proof of how important it is to save the artistic and recorded value of traditional and vintage vehicles. I know some of you, you know, Henry at least, had one, an older car, um, but there's something very satisfying, something very intriguing to watch an expert take something 
worn out and shot and make it into something beautiful. And even if you have no interest in the subject, I think it's still fascinating and satisfying to watch something worthless turn into something really valuable, whether it's an old car or a tractor, gun or antique tool. Watching life come back into something like that is just, it's just neat. And while I'm not going to be talking about restoring antiques today, I am going to be talking about restoration. This type of restoration is way more beautiful than watching an old car or tractor come back to life and restore their former glory. So I want you to read our text, and it's just one verse, but I want you to keep your Bibles open to this verse. I'm going to be continually looking back on it throughout this, this message. Galatians 6, verse 1. Brethren, or sisters, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, I want to start today's message by clearing up something that sometimes is overlooked in regards to this subject of spiritual failing, and that is the subject of perfection. But before I talk about that, I'd like to read you a perfect story. There was a perfect man who met a perfect woman. After a perfect courtship, they of course had a perfect wedding. And their life after was, again, perfect. One snowy, stormy Christmas Eve, this perfect couple was driving along a winding road when they noticed someone on the roadside in distress. Being the perfect couple, they of course stopped to help. And wouldn't you know it, there stood Santa Claus with a huge bundle of toys. Not wanting to disappoint any children on the eve of Christmas, the perfect couple loaded Santa and his toys into their vehicle. Soon they were driving along delivering the toys, and unfortunately the driving conditions deteriorated to the point where the perfect couple and Santa Claus had an accident. Only one of them survived. Who was the survivor? The answer is the perfect woman. She's the only one that really existed in the first place. Everyone knows there's no Santa Claus and there's no such thing as a perfect man. <laughs> now, before you women get too big of a head. <laughs> so if there was no perfect man and no Santa Claus, that meant the woman had to be driving. Thus, the car accident. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that was a joke. I think you realize that. <laughs> There's no such thing as perfect people, right? And there is no such thing as a perfect Christian. That's such a misconception and expectation placed on people, and people expect Christians to be perfect, or when you become a Christian, all suddenly I'll be perfect. It's all wash. We've had discussions on Wednesday nights already about sanctification and what that means. And many people mistakenly believe that sanctification means that suddenly you'll be perfect. We'll never sin. And that can't be further from the truth. What this perfect or perfection means is a perfection of our desires. We shouldn't desire to sin. However, there are going to be times when we trip and fall. We're humans. And that's not going to change. And humanity is going to be on board until we receive our eternal reward. And therefore, I want you to keep this in mind as we move forward into this study of restoration. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Nor should we expect each other to be perfect. And that being said, before we get into the subject of restoration, I want to study the first part of this verse. So look at the verse with me again. First part says, Brethren... If a man is overtaken in any trespass. NIV, I think, says if someone is caught in a sin. Now, all the times I've read this verse in the past, I've always pictured it as someone who was habitually sinning, someone who was living in sin, an apostle stumble. But I want you to notice the terms used here. Overtaken, caught. These terms mean the person is surprised or caught unaware. This is what these, the original language means here. This is not referring to a person that 
has a pattern of sinful behavior, um, continually goes back and commits the same sin over and over again. This is referring to someone who's really trying to please God, and in a moment of weakness, they made a mistake and failed. And that's very important to recognize, to get that straight before we move, move forward with this. Look around this, this church today. You're sitting with a group of flawed and perfect people. And if you don't think that, then go find another church, because <laughs> we won't find it there either. And like Paul said, he's the chief of sinners. I can tell you, I'm the cream of the crop as far as an imperfect person. And I readily admit it. That's why I want to make this subject of perfection perfectly clear, or the lack of perfection perfectly clear. If we're expecting perfection, then we're going to be extremely disappointed in others and in ourselves when there's a failure. But if we recognize that each person is imperfect and capable of falling, then we can more graciously help in the restoration process. I've shared with this, with this subject with different people, and I'll share it with you now. I've had conversations with people that have fallen and made a mistake and failed, and and, and this is a person who's genuinely trying, really genuinely trying to be a good Christian and, and trying to allow the Lord to lead them. And they, they fail, and there's a lot of self-condemnation, and, and I, I just, how could I do that? And and if people really knew what I did, they wouldn't have any confidence in me anymore. And how would they trust me? You know, those kind of conversations. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced it, had conversations with people that have, or even done it, felt that way yourself. And what I've shared with these people, and different ones each time, each of us has our own areas of weakness. We have our own areas that we are weak in. Mine is a short fuse. It's handed down generationally, and I will own it. I'm not proud of it all the time, but I'm not proud of it any time, but I'll own it. And so there are times when I react to my wife and my kids in ways that if someone was looking on doing, what's, what's going on there? And I know there will be a surprise factor. Therefore, I know that I want a level of grace for my feelings. And if someone was to see that and be like, try to be understanding, that I need to have that level of grace for other people, for their feelings. And I realize that my desire, my complete desire is to serve God faithfully, but there are also times and situations that build up to the point where my fuse gets blown. And therefore, I know behind any failing, there is ultimately an underlying reason for that failure, and that is human weakness. And if I expect to have others show me grace, then I need to show grace. So now let's get through this process of restoration. There's three steps in this process. Someone who has slipped and fallen. Let's first talk about the act of restoration. To start, understand that a Christian isn't to go looking for sin in the lives of fellow believers. If you want to destroy the soul of a church, be cynical, Look at everyone as dirty, rotten sinners, as less than you, no good, and it will damage the church really quick. Read with me from my text again. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual. And we'll stop there. We need to keep in mind, as we already stated, that people are going to fail. It's going to happen. And while we're not to be looking for it or expecting it, when it becomes evident, we need to start by not being judgmental, but rather let the Spirit lead us to help. And the only way we can truly help others in their time of weakness is if the Spirit is living in us. There is no way you can help another person spiritually if you're not serious about your relationship with Christ. The Holy Spirit has to have command and first chair in your life. Those of you that are in music can understand what first chair means. If you turn back to chapter 5, and go ahead and do that because it's not far, we can turn quickly back to chapter 6. In fact, you might not even have to turn the page. 5 verse 13, follow along with me. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but... Through love, serve one another. 
For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. See, if we're living and truly being led by the Holy Spirit, we won't be looking for ways to tear someone else down for their failures. We'll instead realize we need to reach out and love because that's what we want in return. So then in verses 22 and 23 in chapter 5, we have those attitudes, and everyone should know these verses, these fruits. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Now, if we go to help another Christian who has stumbled, we need to be spiritual. Not the spiritual as in, I'm a spiritual person and I'm here to help you. Not that kind of spiritual. But spirit-led, filled with the Spirit, knowing that Jesus is in me and I'm just as imperfect as you. We need to approach the other person realizing how quickly I can fall, how quickly we can fall, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if we have that attitude, we won't be critical and harsh, but rather loving and desiring to help them be restored. Which leads us to our next point, which is the aim of restoration. Read from our passage again, and I'm going to, again, as we, as we look back, I want to read it over again and then stop at the point where I want to study Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you which are spiritual, restore. And that's the word I want to focus on here. In the study Bible that I was using for this sermon, there's a really good paragraph, and let me read that to you. While the legalist seeks to exploit the fallen one, the loving believer is concerned for the fallen person's good. Restore which is from a Greek word used to describe the setting of a broken bone and the mending of broken nets, describes renewed harmony between quarreling factions. When confronting another believer which is in sin, we should aim for repentance from sin and restore relationships. So what is your desire when you see someone trip and fall? Do you want to help them? Or do you want to advertise it and and point out to everyone else what they did that was wrong. Put yourself in their shoes. If you did wrong, how would you want others to help you? Would you want them publishing what you did wrong? Or would you want them to help you through it and help you restore you to your relationship that you know you need to have with Christ? How many times have you had an issue in your life where you fell? And when properly dealt with and confessed, you found yourself closer to the Lord after. Oftentimes when there's a rift between people, conflict, whether it's between spouses or friends, and you deal with that conflict, oftentimes you're closer afterwards. And that's the same with our relationship with God. If there's a problem and properly dealt with, you'll often find yourselves closer to God because you dealt with it properly. Like scripture states, Fire is what refines us. And sometimes there's failures, there's falling, is the fire that refines us. A few years ago, an angry man rushed through that, I'm not going to say this right, but the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam, until he reached Rembrandt's famous painting, Night Watch. Then he took out a knife and slashed it repeatedly before he could be stopped. A short time later, a distraught, hostile man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome with a hammer and began to smash Michelangelo's beautiful sculpture, the Piata, or however you say that. Two cherished works of art were severely damaged. It tells you I don't know my art. But what did officials do? Throw them away and forget about them? Absolutely not. <clears throat> Using the best experts who worked with utmost care and precision, they made every effort to restore the treasures. By his sovereign grace, God can bring good out of our failures and even out of our sins. J. Stewart Holden tells of an old Scottish mansion close to where he had his little summer home. The walls of one room were filled with sketches made by distinguished artists. The practice began after a pitcher of soda water was accidentally spilled on a freshly decorated wall and left an unsightly stain. At the time, a noted artist was a guest in the house. One day when the family was out at the moors, he stayed behind with beautiful, masterful strokes with a piece of charcoal. That ugly spot became the outline of a beautiful waterfall bordered by trees and wildlife. 
He turned that disfigured wall into one of his most successful depictions of Highland life. And that's what Jesus can do with us when we fail. The aim of restoration is to help the offender to be an even better and stronger Christian than they were before. And that won't happen if our attitude towards them is harsh and judgmental. And that leads us to the third process, the first, third step in this process, and that is the attitude of restoration. Look at our text again. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Martin Luther said this about this passage. Brethren, if a man be overtaken with a fault, do not aggravate his grief, do not scold him, do not condemn him, but lift him up gently to restore his faith. If you see a brother despondent over a sin he has committed, run up to him, reach out your hand to him, comfort him with the gospel, and embrace him like a mother would. When a person has fallen and is in absolutely without doubt in this category of really trying to be faithful, and they have fallen, been caught, been surprised, and, and tripped and fell, there will be genuinely a despondency and sorrow over what they've done. And the last thing they need is someone coming up and rubbing salt in their wound and telling them how bad they were. They'll feel like a failure and that God is so disappointed with them and how we ever take them back. And it's at that point that we, other believers, who desire to show grace, need to come alongside them and encourage them. When you hear someone that fell, failed, made a mistake, What's your response? Well, that doesn't surprise me. They did what? What's their problem? And instead of those reactions, maybe we should practice this gently, like the scripture says. Yes, I understand. It's hard to live in this world. This messed up world is difficult. Satan has a lot of pitfalls, and I'm here to help you. Folks, we need each other really bad. If we abandon one another when we need each other most, where will we be? We need to have each other's backs spiritually. But the big takeaway from this verse is the part we need to consider ourselves. We are immune to failure. We should all know this. And if we try to be critical and judgmental over someone's failures, that's opening us up for a lot of trouble. And if we can remember that, I think it would help us not be critical and judgmental. There's a couple of passages that really speak to this truth. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, one of my favorites. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. A person so cocky and thinks they have it all together, that's a sitting duck. <clears throat> Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That's self-explanatory, right? You think you're so high and mighty? Well, you'll be brought down a peg or two. And I can't emphasize this point enough. We need to watch our attitudes when someone else fails. It's so easy to go into that judgment zone, just unconsciously. I even caught myself doing it here this week over something I heard about. And as I was preparing this, I realized how quickly I do this. Maybe not even consciously, like, what? Why in the world would they do something like that? We need to always think of how we would want to be treated if we were in that situation and respond the way we would want to be treated. This passage tells us that no one is free from the pitfalls of sin. James 3, verse 2 tells us that we stumble in many things. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But that's not the end of the story. Because of Jesus Christ, no believer is beyond the possibility of restoration. 1 John 1, 8 says about deceiving ourselves, we say we have no sin. 
But 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So after studying this passage in a new light, it helped me realize I'm not responding the way I should be when I hear of someone falling. And I'm wondering, how did it affect you? Cause you to think through this again in a different way? Let's determine, help each other out, lift each other up, because you just might need them to help you someday. Stand with me, please. I don't know where you're at this morning spiritually. I mean, I think by the indication of you being in church, you want to serve the Lord, and that should be your desire. But determine. We're going to help each other. And if there's something that is askew in your life, you can go ask someone for encouragement. Maybe they can help lift you up. And give it to God. And determine you're going to give Him first place in your life. Lord Jesus, would you help each one of us to determine that you are first? And if there's someone that fails, we'll be there to help them, to encourage them and not kick them when they're down. Help us to be that encouragement and Lord, help others to be there for us. Because we know that restoration is a strengthening process to help us keep closer to you. Thank you, Lord, for those that are here and for those that may watch this later and I pray you just be a blessing. Give us a good day in you, Lord, and we thank you and praise you. In your name, amen. Yes.